Ah, uh, there we go. Well, again, good evening, everyone. So here we start uh, after the after the fall start of two weeks ago. We we start again, um, and back to the story of Exodus. We'll be crossing. We not we. We'll watch as the Red Sea is crossed this evening. You all know that story, right? Yes. 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 I thought so. We saw the movie. It's it's <laughs> going to be hard to stay awake because everybody knows that story. It was the best part of the movie, probably. We saw how they made that. Did you? Yes. Oh. You, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to call on you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Okay, here's here's the stuff that's always there. Again, if you, you want the email stuff, just send me an email and I'll send the flood your direction. Um, the slides that you see tonight will be sent out right after the class. And uh, uh oh, now we have 14. 14, no longer the prophetic number. Oh, me. You're asleep a little bit. <laughs> oh, me. Um, the recordings will be put together uh, later this week, and uh, they'll be up Thursday, Friday, some, sometime. Uh, Nancy, our new wizard with these things, is very, very good. So we, she's super, and she's only done it twice, um, but she's doing really great. Okay, and all you at home, I thank you that you've already muted. Um, but if you have something to say, please unmute. And wake me up, okay? All right. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us through this day and to this assembly of fellowship around your holy word. Lord God, fill us up. Fill us up as, as you filled up the Israelites with courage and with power when they needed it most. Fill us up with what we need the most in our lives. Show us which way to turn, point us in the direction to go, and give us the courage to go as you direct us. And help us always to follow the path of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay. Last time we did a review of uh, a whole bunch of, I don't know what that came from, a whole bunch of chapters, uh, 13 of them. Um, and now we'll do a review of the review. <laughs> nah, uh, it, it, for, for Mark, this is ridiculously fast. Remember, as we left off back before the summer, the first Passover was instituted. Um, it would serve two purposes, the fulfillment of, of the last plague, that is the angel of death, uh, killing the firstborn in all the Egypt, Egyptian households and passing over those in the Israelite households. And it also serves that 10th uh, plague as or this uh, Passover as the beginning of the Exodus itself. Eat the meal, be ready to travel, go. Forget all those numbers at the top of the slide that some crazy person put those there. Okay, <laughs> we're done with the review now. Nancy's happy. <laughs> okay, here's here's where we're going. And and again, um, what you know, if if I ask any group of people who have spent time in a Christian church. Tell me the best known Bible stories uh, in your, you know, repertoire. We would, of course, hear Christmas and Easter, and the not bush. And, and maybe the bush, maybe the bush, oh, but certainly, <laughs> but certainly, the the passing through the Red Sea would make the top five, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the that's among the stories in, in the way I learned it from my mother with a felt board uh, in Sunday school <laughs> class as a kid. We've all taken this in, and we've seen the movie. Right. And and I will make the argument that if it looked sort of like that, that's a bad depiction. And I'm going to make I'm going to say that Mr. DeMille didn't do a great job either. He did the best he could. And we're going to talk about that. Anyhow, um, what we're going to hear about is God's deliverance of his people from from enslavement and, and oppression in the land of Egypt. Right. And he, we pass through the waters to do that. And it's it becomes a baptismal event in, in the Old Testament um, way of, of thinking for Christians. And when you hear it preached, which is sort of rare, given how prominent the story is, it's always preached as a baptismal event. Right. So they, they pass away from that, the sin that oppresses them here into a life that God has promised. So chapter 14 that we'll consider tonight has two parts, roughly half each. The first 14 verses are the instructions. It's interrupted a little bit um, with Pharaoh's voice heard, but it's basically the instructions from God to give to, given to Moses, Moses to give to the people. Here's what we do. 
And then the remainder of the chapter from 15 through 31 um, talks about what actually happens and from which the grand movie was made so long ago. Okay. All right. Ready for the travel. Ready for the trip. Chapter 14. I'm going to take it just eh, as mine is broken up a paragraph by paragraph. Um, yours may have different paragraph breaks, but we'll work through that. So the first four verses. Do not do that to me. Thank you. The Lord spoke to Moses. So all this is the Lord's words. He said, tell the Israelites that they must turn and camp for Pi Ha'eroth between Migdal and the sea. You are to camp by the sea before Baal Zephon opposite it. Pharaoh will think regarding the Israelites. They are wandering around confused in the land. The desert has closed in on them. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them. I will gain honor because of Pharaoh and because of all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So this is what they did. So far, so good. Uh, they're listening to the Lord's command, right? These are explicit instructions given from God. Chapter and verse, go to this spot on the map. Stop there. You know, so what, what looks to Pharaoh or will look to Pharaoh like they're, they're entrapped is exactly what God has planned. Go to this spot. And all of this is given through Moses. Again, Moses in the tradition of the Hebrews is the greatest of, of all of the prophets because prophets bring God's word. Moses is very faithful in that. We Christians don't think of him like that. We think of him as a historical figure, but he is acting clearly as a prophet, bringing God's word to the people. In verse 3 that I just read, um, it is said by the Lord that Pharaoh will think the Israelites are out wandering around confused. I didn't use the word Iowa. But you get the idea if you know what Iowa stands for. You don't know. <laughs> people in Michigan, well, yeah, people in the Midwest all kid each other and they all have these rivalries. So they, they say Iowa is an acronym up in Michigan where I served for a long time. It means... Mm -hmm. I'll leave the first word out, out wandering around. Not very smart people out wandering around. Okay, That's Iowa. Oh, that's not nice. We're not nice to each other up there. I mean, it, the people in Ohio don't even say the word Michigan. That's the state up north, right? And, and vice versa. It's, it's crazy to live up there. But anyway, it, it's like they're going to be out wandering around. Now, that's an utter statement of disrespect like my own, it's an understatement of disrespect that the Lord is already predicting that, that Pharaoh is going to make. Uh, who wanders around aimlessly in the desert? Well, a group of people with no leader, right? Who's leading the Israelites? Well, at the first level is Moses, right? The visible level. And you see Moses there. And so it's an utter disrespect for Moses. And, and having gone through the 10 plagues and all the other interactions between Pharaoh and Moses, you can see there's no love lost, right? Pharaoh has no respect for Moses, even though Moses has won with his God's power every single confrontation. The other thing is we already have been told about that pillar of fire and cloud that leads the people. It's the presence of God, right? And Pharaoh, the self-proclaimed God on earth, apparently doesn't know about that or has knows about it, but has no respect for that either. He has no respect for the Lord. So this, they're out wandering around confused. Not, not a good sign for Pharaoh. And again, the motif, right? The motif of wisdom literature. The one who's supposed to be wise is really a fool. Pharaoh, is, is, as the leader of the greatest nation on earth, even though they've gone through the 10 plagues, they still have that distinction for the moment. Um, he's a fool. He's an absolute fool, and he displays himself to be so. And Pharaoh will notice that the desert is closing in on the Israelite people, meaning they're getting to a point where they just can't go any further. There's, there's nowhere to go. The sea here, the desert there. How much food did they live, leave Egypt with? They've got a little bit of that bread left over, maybe, that, you know, they can, they can carry with them. They've got their pack animals, but if they eat their pack animals, they can't move anymore. So they really don't have any food with them. That's next week's story. So Pharaoh will expect that they're going to be closed in and, and not able to advance and be sitting ducks for what he has planned. 
Remember, all of this is not Pharaoh speaking. This is the Lord telling Moses what Pharaoh will do and why he's going to do it before he does it. Okay? And that's, that's really important that we understand that. It's also said here that Pharaoh's hard, heart was hardened. And, and this hardening is a different word in the Hebrew than the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was during the plagues. And what it means is, this one takes on a little different connotation. Pharaoh's will, Pharaoh's determination to do what Pharaoh wants to do has been made steadfast by the Lord. So it takes on that little different, instead of just being stiff-necked and obstinate, he is now with a purpose, being stiff about what he's going to do. And the Lord has done that to Pharaoh to bring about what comes next. So the Lord's judgment as we go forward is going to destroy the wicked. And the Lord's judgment is going to reveal his own glory and majesty and sovereignty. He is the king of creation. Isn't that what judgment always is? If we were to go to Revelation and get glean what we can about uh, what the final judgment is going to be like, aren't these same things done there? God's judgment always separates the, the sheep from the goats or the wheat from the chaff, the wicked from those who have been faithful and to his glory. So there's nothing out of the ordinary here for God's uh, ability to make judgment. Nothing at all. Okay. Any questions about that first bit? All right. Let us move forward to the fifth verse and following. When it was reported to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And the king and his servants said, what in the world have we done? For we have released the people of Israel from serving us. Then he prepared his chariots and took his army with him. He took 600 select chariots and all the rest of the chariots of Egypt and officers on all of them, or officials. That word is difficult to translate, officers or officials. Anybody have another word of captains? Who? Captains? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good name. That's a good word, too. We'll talk about that a little bit. Now, yeah, here's Pharaoh and his wisdom again, right? All our workforce, he and his court say, have gone away. Now we don't have anybody to work. We got all chiefs, no Indians. We need the Indians back, do the work of Egypt. So how do we get them back? We send the army out to kill them. What's <laughs> wrong with that thought? <laughs> this is this is just like, you know, we're going to make them make bricks out of without straw, and that'll keep them from making babies. Hey, get there from here. But this is Pharaoh. This is Pharaoh, right? And so verse five is, they're, they're, what are we doing here? You know, we let all our workforce go. We got to fix that. Forgot the plagues already. I guess that wasn't severe enough for him. So he takes his 600 best chariots, right? And all the other chariots too. So maybe that's thousands of chariots. Don't know. But the 600 absolute best are going to lead the way. And then the chariot crews were made up and in, in, made out of, in, in Bill's reading, um, captains or officials or officers, uh, the relative translations we have in English. Think about this. The Israelites are the sitting ducks that we've heard already, right? They're unarmed. They've got no food. They've got nowhere to go. They're stuck up against the sea with desert on the two sides, and all they can do is starve to death or, or, or die of thirst out there. Um, and so Pharaoh's going to send out his best military equipment to go take care of this. How much threat is there to Pharaoh's army in his perception? Zero. Yeah, as close to zero as you can measure. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> now, remember his officials who were saying with him, what in the world have we done? Think maybe Pharaoh put those guys in the chariots too? Could well be. They are officers of the court. So it may well be, in addition to the military, there were the courtiers, if you will, the people who advised Pharaoh in the court. They too may well have been on the chariots. And at this point, everything that you hear that this military movement does 
Pharaoh is with them. But at some point, Pharaoh gets left out of the discussion. And we'll come to that too. But for now, Pharaoh's going on a chariot out there. So it's reasonable to expect, most of them are his relatives, these court officials are on chariots too. It's a field day. It's going to be easy. Okay. Let's look at verse 8 and follow it, shall we? But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the Israelites. Now, the Israelites were going out defiantly. Remember that word. That's a fun word. The Egyptians chased after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army overtook them camping by the sea, beside pi Haroth before baal Zephon. When Pharaoh got closer, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, and they were terrified. The Israelites cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the desert? What in the world have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians, because it's better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Lovely thinking, huh? Hey, maybe one. <laughs> okay well early on in that passage we hear that the israelites depending on your translation went out defiantly or with high hand or boldly it just depends on the translator did with that they went out with their fists in the air they were full of themselves right they didn't know the egyptians were after them but they went out they've been made rich with silver and gold and fine clothing the lord has taken their side and defeated egypt out there going, and they're full of themselves as they initially leave, right? But after traveling a little while, somebody looks over their shoulder, and here come the Egyptians, right? They're, they're you know, militarily, they're armed to the teeth. And the Israelites did not see this coming at all. Now think about a military movement and how you form a military movement when you march a large number of people. And I've I tried to make the case, and I will again tonight, that there's roughly 2 million people in this mass going forward, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going forward into a land you do not know, and you don't know what threats are ahead of you, you put your best soldiers out in front, right? Or at least the strongest men. And then along the sides, you put more good stout men. And in the middle, you put the children and the women and, and those who need protecting. That's just the way it is. So you have sort of like a horseshoe affair moving forward. And where are you most vulnerable? Where you came from, right? Where are the Egyptians coming from? Where you came from. So they're in a classic military movement. They're ready for anything except what shows up. And what shows up is, is a horrible threat. It's the Egyptians' chariots on their heels, right? So they understand this to be what it is. It's, it's horrible danger. In the ancient world, it's as bad as it gets. So they cry out to the Lord, my text says. And that is something appropriate to do. When they were enslaved in Egypt and, and Moses was off in, in Midian, they cried out to the Lord in their, in their pain. And the Lord sent someone to deliver them, right? It's, it's appropriate to cry out to the Lord when we're in pain. And they do that. But in the space of one comma later, they're also after Moses. Doggone it, Moses. You know, and, and they're disloyal to him. And they just they just want to, you know, slap him around a little bit. Why'd you bring us out here? Look at the danger we have now. We didn't have any danger back there in Egypt, right? Everything was hunky dory back there. Remember? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's appropriate for their time, you know, somewhere you know, 1,200 to 1,500 years before Christ, but you got to wonder what they were smoking. <laughs> now, consider this challenge they bring to Moses. I mean, it's, it's, verges on crazy, right? Remember Moses killed that Egyptian way back when he was a young man, and he buried him in the sand? That was a disrespectful thing. And one of the things that um, Israelites held on to culturally is a proper burial. You know, and be being buried in the sand, being just sort of covered over in the sand is not a proper burial in the Hebrew tradition. 
But if you're going to lose a, a major battle out here in the sand on the edge of the sea, that's exactly what's going to happen. And they, they didn't want that in the least. You know, the only thing more terrifying than dying is not having a proper burial and, and being prepared to meet the Lord, right? But back in Egypt, they had graves back there, right? They had, well, they had sand too, but they had ground in which people are buried. In fact, Egypt's a place full of tombs and graves, still is. Pyramids, right? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was full of those places. And it, why were we out here in the desert? We could have been back there, right? Um, now, look at, let me go at, at verse 12 a little bit. The people say to Moses, isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians. Because it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. You remember them saying that before, anybody? No. How about that? Nancy gets a prize. The answer is no, they never said that. Now, eh, they got eh, marginally close to that a little bit one time, but never exactly that or anything real close to that, right? We have not heard these words before, have not. But think back to the days when they were denied the straw. And the foreman got mad at Moses and went to complain to him. Their complaint was along the same lines. You know, look what you've done to us. That's about as close as it gets, right? But those complaints made way back then seem to be more justified now, right? This situation makes more sense for those that foreman complained quite a while ago than, than now. So here, here we are. They're whining and complaining. In the desert, death surrounds them. Everywhere they look, there's drowning, there's dying by lack of food or water, and there's the Egyptians. Pick your, pick your path. They have nothing with which they can see upon which they can pin their hope. And so they come to Moses with this, I told you so attitude, right? Told you you should have left us in Egypt. We'd have been much better off there. We had great food in the flesh pots and we had you know, places to bury our dead and all that nonsense. And what does that come from? When we act like sniveling, whining babies, what does it come from? It comes from fear of something, right? And that's what we're seeing here. It's one of the most powerful human drivers, this fear. Aren't they kind of boxed in? Absolutely, they're boxed yeah. in. I mean, and I mean, so visually, it's right there in your face. Absolutely. Sure. It, in the sense of the sea in front of them as they were marching, the yeah. desert where they starve or, or, or uh, die of thirst on either side and the Egyptians behind them. It's, it's a perfect box for which they can see no escape. Exactly. Yeah. And so that drives the fear and the fear drives this behavior. They, they're humans, right? They're humans. Yes, Tim. I got a question. Uh, uh, did they take animals with? I'm sure they took sheep, goats. They've got pack animals. Yeah. And, but the thing is, remember when they said they were starving in the wilderness and when, when God fed them man and everything, well, they had the animals, but... Well, they do to a point. not enough for all the uh, millions of people. Yeah, I, I made the point a little bit ago. They have the bread from the Passover meal that they were able to carry out. That uh, They have a little bit of that. Okay. Then they've got their pack animals, but if you eat your pack animals and you're in the middle of the desert, you're, you're not getting out of the desert, right? True. So they've, they've, they're really in a Hobson's choice here. <coughs> and next week, we'll hear about how God solves the food problem. <coughs> but for the moment, they've got a food problem. Okay. So you've, you've heard how the people, when they wander for 40 years, are murmuring or grumbling or whatever the adjective is in your translation, right? This whining and complaining. that, that comes back and forth, the worst case of which is the golden calf and those kinds of things. Um, this, is, this is the beginning of that motif. We see it established here and the people will sometimes rise above it, but they always seem to slide back into it. And, and it comes out of fear. Do you trust the Lord to take you to um, the place of safety and prosperity that the Lord promised or do you not? Right? And if you don't, you, you certainly have a lot to fear in this world. And that's where they find themselves at the moment. It's usually okay. a combination between fear and faith. 
whatever you have, whatever you're lacking faith, it's all picking up on fear. Something's got to fill that void. And most of the time, like you said, it's fear. Well, yeah, your typical human finds much more time of their lives in fear than they do in faith. And they say people that, you know, are not Christians, you just spend a lot of time worrying. Well, and, and Moses, Moses in his wisdom, maybe God whispered in his ear, but he addresses that exactly in verse 13, where he says, Moses said to the people, do not fear, right? Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord that he will provide for you today. For the Egyptians that you see today, you will never, ever see again. The Lord will fight for you and you can be still. Anybody have one of those little plaques in their kitchen or some such place in the house that say, says from the Psalms, be still and know I am the Lord. And this is the same instruction, the same uh, sentiment comes out of Moses' mouth in Exodus. And um, I don't know where the psalmist got from, got it from or vice versa, but um, certainly it's a consistent theme in the Bible. But be still, stand right where you are and, and watch. Sort of hard to do in the modern world, isn't it? When you're boxed in by something of life, do you stand still and watch God solve it? Most of the time we're not patient enough. I, I don't know many souls who are. Yeah. So again, Moses commands. This, eh, it wasn't an option or a suggestion. Stand firm in my translation, right? We're his commands. They're not to run in any given direction. Boxed in, as Nancy points out, they've got no place to run anyway. Don't even think about it or take a swim, right? Do not fight. The flight or fight um, sort of alternatives is how you deal with fear if you're a human being most of the time. Moses commands the people, do neither. Stay right where you are and watch what the Lord does. God will do the fighting and provide the victory and the salvation. This is a lesson for Israel, right? Every time in the Elder Testament, that someone, some group of Israelites goes out to fight, when the Lord leads them in that, they prevail. And when God doesn't do that, it's, it's some king or judge or one of those that does it of, of their own volition for their own glory, what happens? Quite the opposite, right? They, and then we see the beginning of it right here. We hear the command, let the Lord do the fighting. In our modern world, can, you know, can we follow that dictum? Can we stand still and let God resolve what's happening in, in Ukraine? How hard would that be? Yeah. On the other hand, God gives us wisdom and, you know, uh, his, his innovation uh, that comes to us through his wisdom. Um, should we put that to work? That's always the hard part, isn't it? Is God leading us in this fight or is God not? Is this a just war or is it not? And my entire life, which began during Korea, um, we as a nation have been wrestling with just that, have we not? Israel always did the same, always had to wrestle with that. Okay. Any questions now before we begin to take the, the leap into the water here? <laughs> And Carl's going to help me help me with the math on this. Okay, starting in uh, verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Uh, just an aside. Didn't God just tell him to stand still and now he tells him to move on? Um, can't God make up his mind? Well, um, there may have, there's a period in between those two commands, but there's perhaps time in between those commands too. So God had them stand as a, as a matter of attitude. God attended to something. Now it's time for them to move because God has made, made ready the opportunity to move. And, and all that kind of detail isn't just laid out here. It just sort of flows. So let's see, where did I leave off? In verse 16, as, and as for you, Moses, lift up your staff and extend your hand toward the sea and divide it so that the Israelites may go through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And as for me, I am going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will come after them, that I may be honored because of Pharaoh and his army and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I have gained my honor because of Pharaoh, his chariots, 
and his horsemen. Okay, there's, there's some things to think about as we hear this. Moses now tells the people it's time to move. And, and that's anybody who has military experience knows sometimes you get the command to fall out and sometimes fall in. You know, you form up or, or you don't. You move forward, forward march, or you halt. I mean, these commands are necessary. And um, they now get the command you know, forward march, essentially. Um, so Moses must, as, as the movie has educated us, although Moses was older than Charlton Heston, <laughs> he must raise his hand over the sea, right, with the staff in his hand, and that will give the people a path to journey forward, right? That will, eh, something like that. And it was very emphatic. Yes, it was. Ooh. Yeah. yeah I, I'm not an actor. I can't do that. So it is the Lord that is making a path for Israel to journey to Israel at this stage, right? And at the same time that he's making a path for the Israelites to walk on dry ground through the sea, he's hardening the, hardening the Egyptians, plural, heart, so that they too go into the sea. So he's leading one and hardening the other, and they're both going in the water, or at least among the water, right? And this is going to lead the Egyptians to know that he is the Lord. Ah, at this point in the story, if you haven't seen the movie and haven't read ahead, how's that going to work? It's a head scratcher it, at this point, just reading it chronologically. Okay, let me see what I want to do here. Yeah, let me do this. Let me read on, read on chapter or verse 19 and following. The angel of God who was going before the camp of Israel, the angel of God being another way to talk about that pillar of fire and cloud, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Okay? So it has been leading them. Now it's at the rear where they're most vulnerable. It came between the Egyptian camp and the Israelite camp. It was a dark cloud, and it lit up the night so that one camp did not come near the other the whole night. Moses stretched out his hand toward the sea, and the Lord drove the sea apart by a strong east wind all that night, and he made the sea into dry land, and the water was divided. So the Israelites went through the middle of the sea on dry ground, the water forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Just like the movie. Sounds like the movie. Sounds that looks like the picture, and that sounds like the movie. Okay, so this angelic presence is, is going to move behind the Israelites. It, it forms, in military terms, a rear guard, if you will. This is various, called various things, the angelic presence, the presence of the Lord, the Lord's symbol of leadership, all of the, it is all of that. Is that a theophany? In a sense, in, in um, I'm sorry? Christophany. Christophany is a Christ revelation, and this would be a theophany or, or a God revelation. The angel. Yeah, well, the angel of the Lord delivers God's word, right? That's the angel is a messenger, but God is God's word. So you, you, it's sort of like a slice of God, which is a heresy, but you get the idea. Okay, it's, it's, God's, it's God's voice. When you hear an angel speak, you're hearing God's intent and God's voice. Ain't, no. So this thing is, is back there behind them now. And the argument by one author I read said, you know, we, we talk about it being a pillar of fire and cloud, right? Depending on whether it's day or night. That's our interpretation. He makes the argument that it's always both. Now, which one is most obvious to you depends on if that's day or night. Mm -hmm. But a theophany in the Old Testament is often God appearing as fire, right. as he did at the bush, right? And will at other places. So the fire presence pretty pretty interesting at this point so it's standing guard between the lord's people yahweh's people and the egyptians um and it in in the words in my translation says it is a dark cloud well if it's a big thick dark cloud at that point can you see through it maybe not and maybe intentionally how big is this pillar in terms of width we're never really told but it may be huge it's as big as god wants it to be right could be huge. And in that case, provide a veil, an impenetrable, well, uh, yes, this dark cloud. 
um, that the Egyptians can't see through to see what the Israelites are up to or what God is commanding the Israelites to do. So it's both a protective move and a strategic move. It does both, okay? And the cloud, through whatever power it exerts, and we're not told how, prevents any of the Egyptians from coming anywhere near the Israelites, like spies getting from one group to the other, and vice versa. It's like an impenetrable fence of cloud, if you will. So it does all of those functions. While that happens, Moses raises his hand. We were told already he was going to raise his hand. So maybe there's a flashback element here, or maybe there's a flash forward element. You know, we, we didn't get things quite in the order they happen. We get them in the order in which God wants to reveal them. But in any event, Moses raises his hand over the water. They are divided. And the Lord, again, makes that path through the sea. Here's where things go wonky. Okay, why the picture might be bad. Carl, what were you going to tell us about that? Oh, well, I saw the way, uh, this was years ago, uh -huh. the way they made the film, and it was uh, glass, basically, and it was separated. It was not very far apart, uh -huh. so they had cameras down below with water coming, air coming up through the water to give you the turbulence. Sure. And they could supposedly walk through it, but if you think about it, if you've got 2 million people, they aren't going to walk through something that size. Bingo. And what the scripture is going to tell us is they've got about four hours from the time they start until the time they get to the other side. 2 million people going through a whole bunch of water. So they were walking fast. <laughs> or on top of each other. So if, if you just sort of do the math, this path would have to be a half mile wide. Go in ahead. order to accomplish that, yeah. to get 2 million people and their animals and, and so on through in four hours. And, and the evidence of the four hours will come in a few verses. Okay. So imagine you've got a, a, a lake, a sea that's got some depth to it. You're going to push all that water to the right and to the left. And it's all going to heap up on top of each other. How big is that heap going to be half a mile or a quarter mile on either side? Very yeah, you're talking Very twin high. towers height. You know, it's just tremendous height. Anybody ever jumped off a high high dive board, like diving board into a, and 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 if you if you don't go this way, you go this way instead. The, you learn that the water is very hard. Okay, right. I, I watched my kid brother do that when he was about eight. It was awful, and we laughed at him. <laughs> Any event. Here's all that water up. And when, when it's going to get released, can you imagine the force? I mean, this is not just, you know, you know, uh, swirly waves. This is tremendous. So the scale and scope of what the Bible is describing is way beyond anything Mr. DeMille could have put together. Uh, they did a marvelous job of making something look good on the big screen. But the big screen can't hold this. This is phenomenal. And the amount of water and how high it's piled and the force it's going to deliver. So 2,000 people are going to cross, as I've already revealed to you, between two in the morning. It's called the morning watch, and my translation begins at around two o'clock and six o'clock, sunup. And we'll see the evidence of that in verse 24 in a bit. Pardon my pun, but you can't water this down. There is... <laughs> <laughs> I, I stole that from another author. <laughs> I can't claim that as mine. But there is no natural way to explain how a half mile wide swath of a sea could get piled up by any strong wind or passing meteor or anything known to humanity ever. This is beyond natural. I know, oh, by the way, we're going to be told that an east wind blows and... and there is no east wind in that, you know, part of the world. And if there were, it couldn't do this. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. Okay, verse 23 and following. The Egyptians chased them and followed them into the middle of the sea. All the horses of Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. At this point, you will not notice that Pharaoh is among the people described. They're all the people assigned to him. And I'm going to stop there for a minute. How many army vets do we have? 
Oh, good. Yeah, there's a distinct Navy. Navy's different altogether. <laughs> there's a distinct difference between the Army and the Air Force in their mentality of how they organize and, and prosecute war, right? In the Army, and it's been this way since the dawn of time, or the dawn of armies anyway, um, the commander of the Army will stand on the hill over here, right? And he, that commander will uh, command um, hundreds of people, perhaps, maybe more. And the commander will want to um, take, if you will, the hill over there. So he'll give the orders and off all of his lower ranking people go and they run down through the valley and up the other hill and they fight and they capture the hill or not, right? But the commander stays back on the rear hill. The Air Force thinks a little differently. In the Air Force, you get the officer, uh, the commanding person, you put them in the cockpit get a half a dozen to a dozen enlisted guys and make sure the plane flies well, and you send the officer off to get shot. It's a whole different mindset. Pharaoh is an army commander. In all, all likelihood, you, you never, uh, wrong words, in, in all probability, he knows the dictum that says you never put the commanding officer in any kind of peril, even accidental peril. He stays back in the rear guard and watches from the back hill. That's where Pharaoh is. He sends his whole army forward to go do his bidding. Pharaoh's going to be a witness as we are to this mess. I always wondered because they always said Pharaoh led the army and then I'm going, well, then how did they know what happened in Egypt? He led his army this way, not this way. <laughs> yes, remember, most of these were women teaching children. <laughs> and they uh, military. I've got a little, a little more military background than I need, I suppose. Right. But I mean, you know, when you think about what they told you in Sunday school, yeah. say from 10 years under, it makes it sound like Pharaoh is in the beginning. Yes. And I've always Later. said, yeah. well, then how did everybody know what God did if they all went? <laughs> in, in the water right. there was nobody there there was no witness so how do they know yeah, pharaoh in, in in the normal way of prosecuting land battle pharaoh was the witness okay maybe that with makes more sense maybe with a spear carrier young man with him but not much yeah. you know yeah. remember it's likely his court was on chariots and going in first because they had the best chariots right Okay, verse 23, let me start at the beginning of that verse again. The Egyptians chased them and followed them into the middle of the sea, all the horses of Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. In the morning watch, 2 a.m., the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw the Egyptian army into a panic. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's flee from Israel, for the Lord fights for them against Egypt. So uh, Egyptians recognize, or at least the foot soldiers recognize precisely what's going on here. No doubt about it. The Lord looks down. Yeah. Anybody remember from the Genesis class, the Lord looking down and what usually that led to? Tower of Babel yeah. looks down. What are they doing down there? Judgment follows, right? Cain kills his brother Abel. The Lord looks down. Noah. And, and then, yes, Noah too. All of those things led to judgment, right? Now the Lord looks down. And there's uh, one of the reference books I had said this looking down um, had an interesting characteristic in one translation, not everybody's translation. But when the Lord looked down, he looked down with a vision that was like fire and water all at once. You can see how that might throw somebody into a panic. Okay, but the Lord looks down, the Egyptian army is in a panic, and their wheels become clogged, and driving was made difficult. So maybe they're not on the dry ground that the Israelites are on. God has somehow made it mucky where they are. Okay, and the Egyptians, through all of this, all these wonders, understand just who they're fighting now. And if they weren't in a panic before, they're in a double panic now. It's, it's runaway time. Runaway. Monty Python. Runaway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's from the Holy Grail. <laughs> okay, so verse 26. The Lord said to Moses, extend your hand toward the sea so that the waters may flow back on the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. 
So Moses extended his hand toward the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state when the sun began to rise, 6 a.m. Now the Egyptians were fleeing before it, but the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that was coming after the Israelites into the sea. Not so much as one of them survived. But notice Pharaoh himself isn't mentioned in that. And it's very consistent once they enter the sea. So at daybreak, as, as said, the waters return. The Egyptians in, in that muck, they apparently are abandoning their chariots and they're trying to just run through the muck to escape any way they can. It is said the Lord throws them down. Not quite sure what that means, but knocks the pins out from under them somehow. So they're totally vulnerable to what is to follow. And as a result, not one Egyptian that entered the sea remains alive. Not one. Mm -hmm. This happens at the dawn of day. Yep. And that's the way I read this. The way it unfolds, Pharaoh had to be the witness to this. So the Lord's victory is complete. In the 10 um, uh, plagues that went before, the economic, the agricultural uh, uh, underpinnings of Egypt were destroyed. The traditional leadership underpinnings, when the firstborn was killed in each and every family, that too um, just cut the, the quick out of uh, the power of Egypt. And now their military might is not just cut, it's gone, right? So what's left of Egypt at this point? The Lord's victory is, is absolutely complete, although that God on earth is probably standing on a hill trying to figure out what just happened. Yeah. What were we thinking? <laughs> okay. And to finish up the chapter then. But the Israelites walked on dry ground in the middle of the sea, the water forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel on that day from the power of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore of the sea. So they washed up. When Israel saw the great power that the Lord had exercised over the Egyptians, they feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Anybody, that last little phrase, they feared his servant Moses, does anybody have a little different twist on that in their translation? Mine says and put their trust in him yeah. mm -hmm. the people fear the lord put their trust in him and in moses his servant yeah moses his servant is the what i was looking for there the mm -hmm. yours is a better translation i think of the hebrew than what i read for you okay. just now yes sir this uh, strange thing i'm thinking about trying to replicate parting of the sea mm -hmm. in a laboratory okay or someone maybe you're producing this movie but rather than the sea parting and the water going to outside you about have to have a wind that would hold that water up that creates chaos <laughs> on the ground that's right so i'm thinking what happens if rather than the sea party if the land underneath were to raise up like in an earthquake, goes up and puts the whole land out of, out of the water. Like a land bridge. You traverse, you go across on the land, and then it recedes. It seems like me, it's easier to do that than it is to try and manage all that water. But it's God. This is true. <laughs> this is true. How did, I'm not saying God couldn't do that. He would have to have to have a God to be able to move that land. Right. But that's another way of explaining it. It's another possible way for the Israelites to get across the water. Well, it may be even more feasible. <laughs> In human terms. Yeah. But what we have is the word of God saying that the water was heaped up. The water was piled up or heaped up um, in the word of God. And we, we can't discount that. We can find other ways. I mean. <sighs> it was just like the movie said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, somebody could have invented a submarine all of a sudden. And then. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's. We can imagine things, but we can't explain what happened, uh, according to God's word, in natural terms.
Like you say, if, if the wind were to have been the agent that parted the sea, you would have had to have wind blowing both directions at the same time, which would have caused a vortex in the middle and would have absolutely torn up anybody passing through. Yeah. So that's not the answer. And, and the answer, as you try to wrestle through these things, become the power of God. It, it has, and that's the lesson here. Whether we can understand how God did it or not, what we have to come away with is the understanding that God did it. Faith. God did it. Absolute faith. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. There's no doubt that he did it. It's just a question is, okay. is there, how, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> if, if the land raises up, you've got a big wall of water. Just like you. Sure. Oh, it could be like the eye of a storm in the middle of the tornado it's coming. But you know they're both entering. They're both entering the water at the same time. The Israelites and the Egyptians, right? And and some of them are going to get drowned, and the others are going to keep walking. You know, it it's a, it's a tough calculus to try to wrestle with. So to finish up the chapter, um, there was one phrase in, in what I read for you that that said, "The Lord saved Israel." If you want a summation of all of Exodus to this point. That's mm -hmm. the phrase. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase that we, and that's the meaning we come away with. Um, and, and it's very, it's key to, to catch that. Um, and what we hear is, is the high point, if you will, of all the things that God has done in, in these first 14 chapters of Exodus. From, you know, finding the, the Savior, uh, Moses, bringing him into God's grace, training him for the day he had to, to go forward. By battling against Egypt in Egypt and now at the sea, all of these things um, came to this moment. I, I think you could argue that the greatest of the plagues was the crossing of the sea, not the other 10. I mean, it, it had that kind of impact. Again, sorry for the pun. Now, my translation, and I, I suspect yours, says the people fear the Lord instead of the Egyptians. Now, it's a different kind of fear. Uh, they understand the Lord's power without any doubt. But we understand, here comes that phrase, fear of the Lord, that we're going to hear so many places in the Bible. They have a healthy respect because the power that the Lord has that no human will ever have. And they come to, they come to believe in the Lord. And they come to believe in Moses. Come on, Moses, you didn't bring us out here to die, did you? No, they've done a reversal one more time. And in that last phrase, Mary's version has a more, I think, a more faithful translation. Moses is given this title, servant of Yahweh, servant of the Lord, right? That's the highest possible title in the Old Testament. It's higher than king. It's higher than judge. It's higher than anything else. We see the tradition of Moses established here at the sea. He is the greatest of all Hebrew prophets. Okay. Okay, now, test question in our last few minutes, right? Well, I didn't want you to see that. How many, <laughs> sorry, how many times, how many times do you think the New Testament writers make reference to the crossing of the sea? You know, it's just one of those things that every one of you knew from your childhood. It's one of those top five Bible stories, right? And the New Testament writers clearly used it as an example a lot, right? No. No. I already gave away the answer. No, they didn't. They didn't. Um, it, it's, it should surprise you how few references to this. A lot of references to Passover. A lot of references to Sinai and giving of the commandments. Very few to the crossing of the sea. Um, I'll, I'll give you a list of them and then talk about some of them in just a moment. In Acts 13, Paul speaks briefly about our fathers who were led out of Egypt, right? And I'll expand on that a little bit. In Luke 1, Zechariah's song of praise of God as the Messiah is, is coming into the world has a mm, phrase about the, uh, about the Exodus, or excuse me, not about the Exodus, about the crossing of the sea. It is very brief and it's not expanded on. And I won't have any more to say about that. It's just a line in a song. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes some more, quite a bit. And I'll talk about that at some length. And in Hebrews in the eighth chapter, 
um, we hear the same things that we would have heard in 1 Corinthians. That's it. That's the whole list. But let me expand on some of that. Oh, where'd you go? Um, the New Testament has to look at the Exodus and put it in a different context. It doesn't make the understanding of the New, it doesn't meld well with the understanding of the New Testament that Paul and the other writers um, later will make. It just doesn't fit. From one of my research books, it says that the Exodus is fulfilled in the life of Jesus. This is the perspective of the New Testament writers. Quote, Jesus not only participates in the history of the nation, Israelite nation, but as the true redeemer of Israel, he ushers in the messianic age, which the original exodus from Egypt only foreshadowed. The true path is following Jesus, not Moses. That's the perspective of the New Testament. That's why the New Testament writers didn't use this as one of the building blocks for explaining the, the uh, ministry of Christ. In Acts 13, Paul's speech begins with a reference to the Exodus, and it concludes that Israel didn't find their freedom through all of this, right? That's Paul, the Pharisees, understanding as he's now preaching as a Christian himself. He says, only in Christ is there freedom from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. You see the departure. It's about Christ. It's not about the commandments alone. The fulfillment of the commandments, the greatest of the commandments, according to Jesus, was not a list of the 613 or the 10. It was one sentence with two commas in it. Love your neighbors. Yeah, right. Love God, love your neighbors as you love yourself. And that's not the story of the crossing of the sea. But that foreshadowed, it definitely foreshadowed what was to come. Follow Moses. If you can follow Moses, you ought to follow Jesus. He is the true path, not the foreshadowed path. In, uh, again, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Again, that baptismal imagery that modern preachers still use for the crossing of the sea by the Israelites. But Paul immediately points to the fact that they all failed, all of Israel failed to receive God's acts of mercy, right? With most of those who were crossing the sea, God was not pleased. How many of them made it to the promised land? There were two. Joshua and Caleb. There were two, but a whole generation had to die out. God was not pleased with God was not eventually pleased with Moses and Moses didn't make the trip into the promised land either. And shouldn't that become a warning to us? And I have to be very careful here, but God has offered you and me and all Christians through our baptisms, um, a promise of a holy land. We call it heaven, right? But there will be a judgment. We have seen there will be a judgment. There was one in, in Moses' time with Pharaoh. We will all face judgment. And some of us, if God may not be pleased with us, I don't know why that would be. We will face that when the time comes. God's mercy and love expressed through Jesus Christ will be dominant. But some will be sheep and some will be goats. And, and we should consider that as we live our lives as followers of Christ. Or maybe it's a quantity. How much do we follow Christ and how much do we not? Just something to consider. And that we take from this story of the sea. Hebrews 8, as I said before, makes the same points that 1 Corinthians 10 does. So I won't spend time, your time on that. Some questions just off the top of my head but I wrote them down here. Um, can we be still like Moses commanded the people? Can we be still and allow Christ to defeat enemies and win salvation? Or do we have to get our hands mucky and do things ourselves? And to Patience. what extent? Patience and trust. Trust. Because it's like, boy, if we've ever needed him, we need him now. Surely. The world is not a pretty place. 
there are many times it has not been a pretty place oh, in the course of his human history. Um, this is one of them. But can we be still and let God be the victor and, and the determiner of right and wrong in these things? It doesn't seem like we can. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be in our nature, does it? No, no. just think of the Second World War. Um, Bill was with me in, in the most recent Bible and Brew, and uh, we're taking a little path, a different path than that. We're not reading a book and discussing a chapter nowadays. We're um, taking something from current culture or news mm -hmm. and bringing it in and trying to decide what the Bible tells us about that and how we should approach that. And so the topic in our first attempt at these things was the, um, the Supreme Court decision on abortion. And, and we talked about that. And, you know, we, here's the mess that our nation as part of the world is, is going through. That's part of it. Um, and we know state by state that's getting to be quite a contentious issue and will be for some years to come at least. Um, what's God's part in that? And will we let God take that part or will we jump in front of, the, of God and do it for him? And, and remember, for every one of us who jumps in front of God because we think God would rather it be this way, there's somebody over here who has some other version of what they think God wants. And they're jumping in front over there. <clears throat> one of us is wrong and one of us is right. One of us is sheep and one of us is goat. And God gets to be the judge of that. Maybe it's better not to jump out there and be sheep or goat. Let, let God just deal with it. I, I don't know how we do that, but it's, as Carl says, very difficult. But as we examine now ourselves, do we live in a way that pleases God? Are we faithful to the scriptures and to followership of Christ, the New Testament witness to this, as opposed to do we memorize the movie? Good to memorize the movie, but that doesn't lead us to faith. Right? Any anything, any any rotten vegetables you want to throw before? <laughs> Not even the Brussels sprout. <laughs> oh, good, because I don't. Uh, I have stories. Um, we will be together next week, both Sunday and Wednesday. Um, so to look ahead at chapters 15 and 16. Much of chapter 15 is a celebration. It's a song written by Moses and his sister and offered by them. Miriam reappears for the first time since Moses was in that little bitty ark in the river. Mm -hmm. His sister reappears, Miriam, and... Uh, uh, I won't go through the whole song, but I, it's a lengthy one, but I invite you to take a look at that. We will talk about Miriam a bit. And uh, then chapter 16 will be the giving of mana. We've already talked about the fact that they're in this horrible place without food, without food, excuse me. And then as you read, think about it, you know, what is, what does it mean that God gives us what we need as opposed to what we want? I want a sports car. <laughs> I don't have a sports car. I'm not going to have a sports car. It's not what I need. And I surely don't need the insurance premiums. You know? But you know, that's an obscene, or see, that's an, uh, an obtuse um, description of, of how we all go through our lives. You know, what do we need and what do we want? And what has God given us? And then do we appreciate that? And can we know the difference? And then when we, what do we do with the excess too? And Israelites have a lot of excess. Remember, they're still carrying all that silver and gold and fine clothing. Right. They have no food, but they they're had heavy pockets. Yeah, no they room. Probably drop some during the run. <laughs> well, with two million, there's probably some in the rear that are picking it up. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Let us pray, Lord God. It is a long evening and. And uh, we've had a good time uh, reliving and, and reconsidering a story we've known since our youth. But Lord God, what the story reveals is that there's more. There's more here than just walking across the sea. As miraculous as that is, the more that's here is following Jesus through the even greater miracle that leads from this life to the next through the power of the waters of baptism that he ordained. Lord God, help us to appreciate these things as we go through our lives and help us always to understand that your power is at work and our power is puny in comparison. And may that guide us 
to uh, follow your ways and let you do the heavy lifting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.